Welcome to today's discussion that's titled Beyond GDP in Brazil, India, and China, Colin, the Prospects for Long-Run Development. I'd also like to thank the Party Center for all its help and support in organizing this event. I know that there's a lot of work involved in organizing the various logistics, and as with all their events, the center has done a commendable job, so thank you. The three countries that are the focus of today's discussion, Brazil, India, and China, are among developing countries that have been identified as having tremendous growth potential and the ability to emerge as formidable economic powers in the world economy during this century. I mean, we all know that both India's and China's exemplary growth performances have been lionized in the international press. But often in these discussions, not sufficient attention is devoted to whether this growth process is actually helping to address the broader issues of development in these countries, such as whether this growth process is being accompanied by adequate quality employment generation, whether it's actually helping to improve the living standards and consumption of a majority of the population, and even whether particular strategies of economic growth are sustainable in a longer term. So it's within this broader development context that we'd like to talk about the long-term development prospects of these three countries in our discussion today. I mean, I do feel that these are issues which are relevant not just for Brazil, India, and China, but also for other developing countries when it comes to planning development strategies and policies. Let me begin by introducing our panelists. On my immediate right, I have Professor Cornell Bahn. Professor Bahn is a professor is an assistant professor in the International Relations Department of Boston University. He specializes in international economic organizations and policy, and in crises, transitions, and the varieties of capitalism, his regions of focus being Europe and Brazil. He's authored several peer-reviewed articles in academic journals, such as the Review of International Political Economy, East European Politics and Societies, History of Economic Ideas, and International Migration. He's currently completing a book manuscript on the political economy of crises, with a focus on the role of economic ideas and the interaction between international and domestic actors. Before joining Boston University in 2012, Professor Bahn was a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University, and he also served as the Deputy Director of Development Studies at the same institution. <coughs> On my extreme right, I have Professor Min Ye. Professor Ye is an assistant professor in the International Relations Department of Boston University and also is the director of the East Asian Studies program at Boston University. She's been a visiting fellow at various institutions both in the US and in other countries such as the SAIS John Hopkins University in Washington DC, the Waseda University in Japan, the Chinese Academy of Social Science in Beijing, and the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation in New Delhi, India. Her teaching and research interests include foreign direct investment policies and regional integration <coughs> in East Asia. She's co-authored a book that's titled The Making of Northeast Asia, which was published in 2010 and has also been the recipient of various grants, including Princeton University's Bradley Scholarship and Bob's Peace Foundation, Japan's Millennium Education Scholarship, and the Pacific Forum Fellowship in Hawaii. Thank you both for joining us today. <laughs> 
As Cynthia mentioned, I'm Suranjana Nabar Bhaduri and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Party Center for the current academic year. I received my PhD in economics from the University of Utah in 2011. My areas of specialization are development economics, international economics, and the Indian economy. My current research interests include analyzing the long-run implications of persistent external imbalances in developing countries, the political economy of international relations, and the development of policies to make the global economic system more attuned and responsive to the needs of long-run development in developing countries. I have published some of my work in academic journals such as the International Journal of Political Economy. And while at the Party Center, as Cynthia mentioned, I've published a party policy brief on the need to complement liberalization with employment and industrial policies in developing countries. I'm currently in the process of revising and finalizing a paper which analyzes the long-run sustainability of India's trade and current account deficits. And I was also a co-organizer in a party roundtable discussion that was held earlier this year, which focused on the need to go beyond GDP-based measures when it comes to measuring and evaluating human development and progress. We'll begin today's discussion with the three of us talking briefly about the defining aspects of the recent growth and development experiences of Brazil, India, and China. Uh, what are some of the challenges that these three countries face or may face in the near future? And what are the overall prospects for development in these three countries in the longer term? After we've set the initial, uh, initial stage for discussion, we'll open up the discussion and invite comments, views, and questions from you. We'll begin with Professor Barn briefly talking about the Brazilian experience. Then I'll briefly talk about India's experience. And finally, Professor Ye will discuss China's experience. And for this part of the discussion, each of us will speak for about 12 to 15 minutes. So without much further ado, I'll now hand the discussion over to Professor Ban. So Professor Ban, Thank you. it's your show. Thank you for the most generous introduction. I'm not used to being called professor all the time, but it's, <laughs> it's great, I have to say, especially in such a broad setting. <laughs> so uh, the spiel here is B, the B in the bricks, or uh, as the running joke is, the great B in growth. Um, as Brazil gets among the rigs these days. So, um, you know, it's a great opportunity for the typical stereotype about la lazy Latins who are hopeless and they always go through booms and busts. But, you know, the discourse never dies. Uh, it comes and goes and there's a romance speaker. Um, I'm very fond of it. What can I say? Um, so Brazil has gone from the darling of the bricks to a bit of a, uh, of a dark, if not black sheep. Um, and um, the point of my, my presentation today um, speaks to that. Um, it's a twofold argument. The first is that what Brazil did is that it put on the table um, um, a developmental paradigm that, that seemed um, defunct um, about a decade ago, which is developmentalism. They put the word neo in front of it, um, and they even codified it uh, in institutional terms as long as, as well as in um, intellectual terms. For, for a while, Brazil became even the um, place where you would be most likely to find um, the world's uh, most prominent Keynesians uh, and um, structuralist economists in the same room. And in 2010, there was even a neo-developmentalist manifesto in Sao Paulo, bringing together a, a few people that we recognize from our graduate school um, reading lists. Um, so Brazil has made something, has pulled off a pretty uh, significant stunt uh, by associating itself with the rebirth of this developmentalist agenda without, however, I argue, uh, disturbing some of the most significant um, uh, pillars of the old uh, or revised Washington consensus. That's basically my main point. Um, it is, um, 
simultaneously a challenge to the Washington Consensus as well as a replication of some of its ideas, uh, while having um, you know structural uh, bottlenecks and uh, and policy issues that um, are dangerous not only for growth but also for beyond growth discussions. So I'm going to delve into that. So first, what is neo-developmentalism? Because you know I'm particularly averse to isms. Um, uh, coming from Eastern Europe and so on, but you know what's the basic idea? So, if we were to boil it down to economic theories, it would be this mix of post-Keynesian, and by post-Keynesian I mean Keynes with a turbo engine, so without the neoclassical additions, like the original Keynes, right? Um, pretty peripheral uh, set of ideas in the in mainstream economics, but very powerful. Uh, in some areas um, in, in Britain, the continent, and um, even more so in Brazil. Um, and structuralist economics. Whether it's a neo-structuralist or, or a structuralist fold, um, the issue remains to be debated. So anyway, the idea is that two formerly um, marginal uh, sets, of, um, sets of economic ideas have been sort of rejuvenated uh, by debates inside Brazil, as well as by policy measures uh, adopted there in the past 10 years. What does it mean exactly? I wanted to walk uh, out of this room with seven basic markers of this. The first is that it's a new form of state activism, kind of obvious, right? If you, if you say Keynes and structuralists, you kind of expect this, so not such a big deal. Uh, but what of, what of what kind? This is the idea, right? Now, the underlying assumption of neo and old developmentalism was that the world economy is the competition between national economies and their firms, right? Now, this might entail in policy practice a lot of uh, the state supporting your firms to either be domestic industrial champions or international champions, which is the case of the multinational Latina, as, have, as the multinationals are being called in the South. The second is that the main, this is, this is absolutely crucial, especially given what we have seen yesterday in Spain um, on the news, that the second most important objective of the new developmentalist agenda is full employment. Um, an, another objective that has been relegated to the doghouse of economic thinking um, in the mainstream. Uh, however, um, the neo-developmentalists insist that full employment should be balanced with, um, with um, uh, stability in uh, conditions of, of price and finance. And that might sound like a cop-out, but I'm going to get into it and see how they pull this one off. The third element um, is that... Um, Economic nationalism entails a certain kind of support for, as I said, for uh, private firms. And this, in the case of Brazil, has been translated into what has been called an open uh, economy industrial policy. That is to say, you support your industrial champions and so on, but not, not only so that they survive and become dominant players in your domestic market, but also that they go international, right? And they go on these shopping sprees that make a lot of sense. Whether you're talking about your banks or your manufacturing, you actually have this strategy of doing so. How do you live with this under the WTO? The Brazilians have done a very smart job at this, like pulling, the w, uh, pulling and pushing the WTO's limits as to far, how far they can go in this process. Um, a fourth element is that they look at the economy as a structural process, which means that they obsess, for, in my view, for, for good reasons, over structural bottlenecks, right? So the biggest discussion in Brazil, which is pretty, has gone mainstream now, Brazil doesn't have um, an infrastructure that would make the most of its potential, right? And if you watch the news uh, very recently, uh, the stimulus of the Brazilian government has shifted from stimulating the economy through consumption to stimulating it through investment and putting 60 billion, arguably less than that, because some of these are old plans, into high-speed trains and uh, airports and so on and so forth, right? So that's a, a focus on, on the structural bottleneck. But the other um, structural bottleneck that they saw is low wages in an economy with an uh, oversupply of labor, right? So there has been an, uh, I'm going to detail this later on, um, has been a very consistent policy of increasing wages um, constantly above the rate of inflation in, during an economic crisis. Now tell this to the Europeans right now, right? This is very heterodox stuff going on um, from this standpoint. Um, another element is the activist uh, macroeconomic policy, especially on the fiscal side. Now. If you uh, look from the helicopters of uh, international sovereign bond investors, Brazil looks, like, looks great, right? I mean, their central bank is like the German central bank. They're very conservative, very high interest rates, uh, although that we might see the end of that. Um, you know, balanced budgets, they have these mandatory surpluses. I mean, it's kind of amazing. It sounds like, you know, very straight Washington consensus kind of country, right? 
But then if you sort of get off the helicopter and you, know, you put on your boots and you walk on the ground, what, what do you see, right? You see a lot of off-the-books fiscal policy, which is done through, um, to, through Brazil's uh, development bank. Um, now, some of you know this, some of you don't, but you know, the, the lending portfolio is about four times what the World Bank has. Uh, so it's not exactly a minor player. It's still smaller than the Bank of China, right? It's smaller than the Germany's Development Bank, but it is a big shark in the water. And they're, they're international, but the state used them during the crisis, this is the key point, to kickstart uh, lending to the productive sector while the rest of the private banks withhold, withheld credit. You cannot pull this off in an economy in which uh, banking is private, right? These guys have 30% of the market. They can actually make a big move once they, uh, they mobilize behind it. Um, now, the thing about be beyond development that has been done in Brazil is that fiscal policy and <clears throat> issues of poverty reduction and quality of life and full employment have been tied together. So the idea of increasing the minimum wage has been regarded as uh, a means to, uh, to reduce poverty, removing a structural bottleneck while being used as uh, a counter-cyclical policy uh, as output was collapsing in 2009. So it kind of pulled off three things at the same time. Um, you know, the old agenda, we know it. Some of it has, you know, the cash, conditional cash, trans, cash transfers to the poor. It's super mainstream now. The World Bank has an entire bureaucracy uh, advocating this. Um, uh, it doesn't necessarily contradict um, an expansionary fiscal policy because it costs very little and everybody has embraced it. So this is not uh, no longer heterodox. Um, but what's heterodox about uh, fiscal policy is that um, there, since 2004, there has been a very clear strategy to win Brazil's um, uh, space for expansionary policies off international uh, bonds, internationally issued bonds. So basically, um, the, the post-Keynesian idea of reliance on international finance as a source of volatility for development has been applied in force. So if you look at how many of the... Uh, issue um, of the bonds issued by the Brazilian government since 2004 have been foreign versus domestic, you will see the foreign, uh, the, the foreign investment in sovereign bonds go down and the domestic investment go up. And that is a significant structural change that has started in 2004 uh, and basically since 2006, um, basically the, the, the government depends more on domestic financial capital than on foreign capital for issuing its own debt. That's kind of like something else I wanted to keep in mind. Now, the main argument, this is, this is neo-developmentalism, and I touched on some of its applications in Brazil. But the main point of, of my argument here is that uh, after the uh, turn to the Washington Consensus in the 1990s, especially, you know, we know the story with Cardoso and so on, um, during the past decade, uh, Brazil built an, uh, a policy regime that recovered the state as a focal point of development, while staying away from the more heavy-handed and inclusionary aspects of old developmentalism. Specifically, while Brazil has more than eroded Washington consensus, it nevertheless did not adapt a full-blown full uh, neo-developmentalist program either. Uh, instead, uh, during the past uh, decade, more specifically 12 years, and especially since Lula's second term, Brazilian governments crafted a hybrid paradigm, which I call uh, liberal developmentalism. And I put the word liberal in front of neo because there have been so many aspects of the Washington Consensus, monetary policy, you know, at least the appearance of a conservative fiscal policy, the opening of the economy, privatization, selective deregulation, that they still below, belong to the old consensus. Um, however, they have been grafted upon uh, old developmentalist institutions as well as new kind of policy innovations that make the state uh, the focal point of, um, of policy making. Uh, so liberal nivel is kind of my new toy. It's like this is my, the new term I'm going to advocate out here. And uh, Cornel Bond, the liberal neo-developmentalist. Um, so um, what has been lost, however, from neo-developmentalism, this is a key point, is that um, the kind of balance between full employment and, and monetary and fiscal stability uh, has been uh, settled in favor of the old Washington consensus. We haven't really seen... I mean, employment has been stabilized, they really worked on it, they pay attention to it. But when it comes to the trade-off, they, they basically preferred to go uh, very orthodox on the main pillars of macroeconomic policy just so that um, they don't get either an international rebellion or a domestic rebellion against these kind of policies.
Uh, now, uh, I would like to stress a few elements of uh, that. How, many, how much time do I have? Five like five minutes. OK, that's perfect. Um, uh, the deal with the redistribution in Brazil. Um, so I touched a little bit of conditional cash transfers. We all know what they are. Basically, you, know, you get something from the state. If you belong to a certain social economic category, there's disadvantage, pr provided that you do these things that are supposed to enable uh, future generations to be more productive and healthy and so on and so forth. And we have seen some major um, uh, effects there, uh, you know, 20 million people out of poverty. I mean, all these figures are well known. I'm not going to dwell upon them. Now, what is um, kind of amazing about these programs um, is that, number one, they cost very little. So they do not come at the cost of uh, what is considered to be irresponsible fiscal policy and transfers to the poor. They cost very, very little. They are advocated by the, both the, the left and the right wing of the spectrum. Nobody disagrees with them at all. Uh, and uh, significantly, Brazil has become like a world policy leader whose uh, experts, government experts working on conditional transfers are being consulted by the World Bank in spreading this. Now, will this, the question uh, raises, will this lead to a social democracy in the global periphery, as a famous book put it? Um, if you talk to the um, people who really matter in, in cash transfer programs, they stress that this will not be universal. It is a very clear point that this is not a gateway drug to like a European uh, sort of welfare state, but it's going to be a very particular um, uh, sort of um, developing country uh, adjustment in which there's a targeted group of people that will benefit from this, okay? That's the first thing I, I wanted to, to stress on this. Uh, some people call it a new developmental welfare state and so on and so forth because from the old Washington consensus, you have the idea of targeted benefits, right? But from the developmentalist side, you have this uh, consistent commitment uh, to spending fiscal resources and not reducing them during the crisis, but increasing them. Because what we have seen during the, uh, when recession struck Brazil in 2009 is that there has been more spending on this uh, kind of distribution uh, programs. Now, um, while we can talk about CCTs as part of some part of the Washington Consensus uh, in a revised uh, uh, version, what is, has been very new to Brazil is that Basically, the bottom income distribution has seen increase, an increase of 38% of their income since 2005 as a result of wage increases, government mandated, uh, over the inflation rate. Okay? Now, this might strike many as being very counterintuitive given the existing policy wisdom um, in, in the global north and in many parts of the global south, but it did happen in Brazil. There have been doomsday scenarios how this will you know, completely kill the economy and so on, but they haven't seen any study sh showing any connection between, uh, between, there's been no inflationary result uh, that is predicted by the orthodox literature at all in this regard. Uh, on the contrary, the way in which Brazilian uh, governments have, have seen this um, is that it's basically a form of um, taking more people from the informal economy into the formal economy, uh, because this measure has been, um, done simultaneously with an expansion of, expansion of the labor inspection uh, capacity of the state. Um, they drew upon some Chinese experience in this regard, which was very, which was very interesting. Um, and it has reduced uh, you know, the, Gini, uh, the Gini score that, that looked absolutely embarrassing in Brazil. So um, another element I wanted to, to, to um, emphasize in this truly post-Keynesian wage policy that, uh, that Brazil has adopted, um, is that there have been very explicit commitments to uh, adopt this while not deregulating the labor market, which is the kind of standard uh, Washington Consensus recipe on this. On the contrary, under the Rousseff administration, uh, labor leaders have the right to sit on uh, company boards, a la West German neocorporatism. So as long as you're in, in, the, in the formal economy in Brazil and have a, a labor union, you probably have institutional means of resource against your employer very similar to the continental kind of model. So an another step away from the old Washington consensus. Um, and, uh, and finally, it's very important to point out that um, um, during the past 10 years, the tax policies adopted in, in Brazil have had the, uh, a very strong progressive income tax uh, policy at their basis. Now, 
I think that the Brazilian uh, tax um, regime is still extremely regressive, but at least at the bottom of the income distribution there have been tax cuts, and that has not happened before. And you know, usually the, the usual supply side argument about reducing taxes on high income uh, earners in a recession that has prevailed in so many settings uh, has not happened here. There has been a reduction in indirect taxes, which are, are the most regressive as well. And the taxation system, system has been used as a means of industrial policy because they targeted, they basically came up with tax cuts for products, for stuff produced in Brazil, like cars and things like that, right? We can argue about how, how sustainable this is, but you know, this is definitely not the old school 1990s uh, kind of approach to development. Now, uh, I end with a caveat. And, and um, we've seen a number of virtuous uh, circles in Brazil in the past 10 years and a lot of doomsday scenarios that have not come to pass. Um, uh, this year, the, the Brazilian economy have, has grown to a very, um, very slow growth rate. Um, and many of us who have argued that Brazil's um, PT4 investment rate of about 18% uh, is probably one of the biggest reasons why this is not happening. It seems like the government is picking up uh, the message. Uh, with this 65 billion investment in infrastructure, um, they may not be enough considering what, what other uh, BRICs have been doing. But two things stand out. One is the obvious financial times line that Brazil's uh, dependence on uh, commodity exports is, uh, is dangerous and you know, obviously it is. Um, but the second thing I'd like to stress out is that um, Essentially, this entire new liberal new developmentalist deal has been struck through a huge class compromise in some ways, uh, or interest group compromise, if you wish, right? Because in a way, it benefits um, <coughs> the financial investor class, right? High interest rates, stable banking sector, et cetera, et cetera. It benefits a state bureaucracy that has seen its um, ranks expand and also has, be has been receiving much more um, respect, at least some quarters of it, the, the ones who are involved in this meritocratically organized aspect of the state. Um, people in the, in, in the state banking sector, in, in the planning boards. Um, so the state has become more, more attractive, right? So that you could see why, why this would happen. Um, you could see why the interests of the lower income brackets have been served in a way that's unprecedented, right? The old developmentalism didn't care about the poor so much, right? So there was very little distribution taking place. This, this time around, it did, uh, a lot of distribution took place. And then the middle classes uh, whose purchase power has grown, um, you know, the traffic jams in Brazil attest to it. They have to build this train, right? Because it's, it's really a nightmare. Um, so in a way, uh, this has been great politically, right? <laughs> Crafting this political coalition that, made po that brought together financial investors and you know, uh, social protesters, okay? Um, however, uh, this has translated into a weakness of the manufacturing sector because the high interest rates you know, hurt uh, Brazil's manufacturing capacity. So while some firms have been, uh, the, the negative effects of this have been offset for the large firms by Benedessa's, um, you know, the state bank's very generous credits, uh, and especially their counter-cyclical uh, credits, bankrolling their, their international expansion, uh, other firms, manufacturing firms, are suffering a great deal, which has led the state into protectionist wars with Argentina and other neighbors. And that doesn't look good. Uh, because if you talk to the Argentines, they think that Brazil is super heavy-handed. It sounds like post-war U.S. giving them tight uh, credit, credits tied to Argentine exports. So there's a lot of like negative potential coming out of that that, that has to be addressed in, in creative ways. Um, I conclude by saying that um, um, you know, the Brazilian government has, has good reasons to feel uh, confident that uh, the kind of investment package and counter-cyclical measures they took out, they, took, they adopted in 2009, 2010, who yeah, really worked, uh, maybe can, can work again. Um, Provided that uh, enough patience exists with the domestic investors in the solvent bonds themselves. Uh, the second is that the expansion of credit has been absolutely out of control. Uh, and that poses some very serious questions about whether it sounds like really oddly similar to the way in which the crisis of Fordism has been dealt with in the West through the expansion of credit. Uh, and the current government's shifting away from, from uh, growth strategies based on you know, private credit into growth st strategies based around investment while factoring in issues of redistribution in a very serious way.
signals that um, perhaps we, we might see an even more heterodox approach to, uh, to development thinking in Brazil. Uh, thank you so much. I think I can start with that. Yes, you did. So thanks, Cornell. That was a very interesting and insightful account of Brazil's growth and development experience, its potential lessons for other developing countries, and I'm sure that we can look forward to an interesting discussion in a little while. I'll now briefly discuss India's recent growth experience. If you look at the 2000s, India's growth rate significantly accelerated during this decade. I mean, particularly during the period from 2003 to 2007, you had India's GDP growing at an average rate of 9% per year. There were three main factors which contributed to this acceleration. One was the rapid growth of India's services sector, which was mainly driven by a meteoric rise in its exports of software services and information technology enabled services. A second factor was a rapid increase in the rates of investment, which were largely made possible by easy access of the corporate sector to a variety of public resources at relatively low prices, in fact, undervalued prices, such as land, minerals, forests, and various spectrum activities for cell phone services. And a third factor was a surge in debt-financed private consumption expenditure on durables, automobiles, and housing, made possible by a rapid expansion of bank credit for financing this kind of consumption, and also by a significant liberalization of capital inflows during the 2000s. Looking at the external aspects of India's growth process, the country has typically tended to import more than it exports, so its external accounts and trade balance have been in persistent deficits. And to finance and sustain these deficits, India has typically relied on its earnings from services exports, on remittances from abroad, and on private capital inflows to maintain these deficits. So to a large extent, this recent rapid economic growth has depended on India's greater integration into the world markets. Coming to the 2008 global economic recession and the way it affected the Indian economy, in the initial years in 2009 and 2010, there wasn't that much of an effect barring a minor slowdown of the growth process. So instead of rates of 9% and 10%, you had the country growing at 7% or 8%. But more recently, in 2012, there's been a more incipient slowdown in the Indian economy. In the last financial year, India's GDP grew at 6.5%, which, mind you, is high compared to the growth of a lot of other countries. But compared to India's past high gro growth performance, it does signal a significant deceleration in economic activity. Then the Indian rupee has been on a downward spiral since late 2011, according to official estimates between November last year and this July, the rupee has depreciated by 20%, which is quite high. Then Indian industry has contracted in recent months and even the manufacturing sector has barely grown at rates of 0.1 or 0.2% in the last few months. Current account deficits and trade deficits have been widening, and investment has also been declining in the last financial year. Coming to the factors which can help to shed light on this more incipient slowdown in recent times, policymakers have tended to focus on the lagged effects of the 2008 global economic recession and more recently the onset of an economic recession in Europe as being the primary factors responsible for this recent slowdown. 
This is true, but if you look at recent reports and studies that have been done on India's recent economic slowdown, these would suggest that there are also other factors involved which have you know, also contributed to the slowdown. For one, you've had the manufacturing sector becoming more and more dependent on imports, and that has adversely affected domestic manufacturers. Secondly, you've also had a dissipation in the ease with which the corporate sector can access public resources because of various public protests over the corporate acquisition of these resources for private use. You've also had various corruption scandals involved in the allotment of these resources and subsequently there have been various rulings by the Supreme Court that seek to monitor the allocation of these resources more closely and the distribution of the benefits from using these resources amongst the affected parties. And besides this, you've also had the banking sector reducing its credit to you know, finance private consumption expenditure of durables, particularly given that it was an unrestricted expansion of such credit which was responsible both for the economic recession in the United States and more recently in Europe. So these are also some other factors which I feel need to be kept in mind when trying to understand you know, why the slowdown in recent times has been so much more dramatic. Coming to the challenges that the Indian economy faces or the human aspects of India's rapid economic growth, one major concern is that this growth process has been almost jobless in character. I mean, the services-led growth path has failed to adequately address the problem of quality employment generation, both relative to India's workforce size, which is more than 450 million, and the fact that a major part of this workforce remains rural and unskilled. There are also reports and studies which suggest that during the years of rapid economic growth, income inequalities and consumption inequalities have significantly increased because this growth process hasn't sufficiently generated quality employment. And even the widening trade and current account deficits are an area of concern because particularly given the slow economic recovery in the United States and now the onset of an economic recession in Europe because it's these two regions which account for the main destinations for India's services exports and are also among the main sources of India's remittances from abroad particularly since the mid 1990s. And now in Europe, there's also talk of the possibility of tighter immigration laws in the future. So this also has the potential to have further lagged effects on India's earnings from remittances. I mean, there's already been some evidence of a slowdown in earnings from services exports and remittances in the wake of these global economic developments. And if the slow recovery and the recession continue, there could be further lagged effects in the future. I mean, even if you look at the potential of short-term capital inflows, particularly portfolio inflows, to sustain these deficits, which is what policymakers have been focusing on, I mean, these inflows have the potential to appreciate the real exchange rate further over time. If the real exchange rate appreciates over time, that will further widen the magnitude of these deficits. As a result, India will need more portfolio inflows to sustain these deficits, which in turn will further build up external debt obligations. And you know, this might, has the potential to reduce investor confidence over time and you know, result in speculative attacks on the Indian rupee and thereby increase the risk of a financial crisis. So even relying on portfolio inflows to sustain these deficits is a fragile strategy to follow. Coming to the prospects for development in the longer term, despite these challenges, I do believe that through a shift in policy focus that attempts to address these challenges more effectively, India's long-term development prospects could become more promising.
I mean, if you look at the policy approach so far, it's been on, you know, further relaxing capital account regulations to attract more portfolio inflows. It's also focused on ways in which to persuade domestic banks to step up their credit for financing the private consumption of durables. And as I said before, you have evidence both from the U.S. economic recession, now the economic recession in Europe, that you know, both these strategies are myopic and extremely risky. One major advantage which India has is a relatively young population, more than 65, not more than, around 65% of India's population is now below the age of 25 years. So through a shift in policy which focuses on ways in which to accelerate the growth and expansion of agriculture and industry and thereby generate more quality employment, I do believe that India could tap into this demographic advantage both for purposes of expanding output and for generating a more inclusive path of growth and development. I do believe that there need to be more active policy efforts directed towards research and development activities through more public-private partnerships, which would help to make the manufacturing sector more competitive, which would in turn help to address India's persistent trade deficits. Um, I do believe that there need to be more comprehensive employment generation initiatives through both infrastructural development programs and rural development programs. I mean, there is already evidence that such programs can work. You have India's National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which despite initial teething problems, has shown its potential to have tremendous employment multiplier effects in several parts of the country. And even if you look at another major rural infrastructure development program of India, the Bharat Nirman program, that's also shown how such infrastructural development programs can help to strengthen the linkages between private consumption, investment, and growth, and you know, thereby make this growth process more inclusive. So I do believe that such initiatives won't be a, just a burden on the exchequer, but would help to contribute to a more inclusive and sustainable path of growth in the longer term. I do feel that you know education policies, public investment policies, and vocational training programs need to focus more closely on developing the skills of the Indian workforce and thereby generating more quality employment, this would also go a long way in reducing India's dependence on earnings from services, exports, remittances, and capital inflows for financing ever rising trade deficits. So through these changes in policies, which emphasize not just the supply side and you know ways in which to attract further foreign financial capital, but which also focus on ways in which to strengthen the domestic market and make the process of demand and consumption more inclusive, India's prospects in the long run could become more promising, both from the point of view of generating a more sustainable path of economic growth and from the point of view of inclusiveness. So I think I'll end on that note. I kept to my time. <laughs> And I'll uh, hand the discussion now to Professor Ye, who will talk about China's experience. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you all for coming to this. Uh, so the first uh, seminar of Party Center, um, and uh, I, I really want to thank um, our moderator for all. She actually was the organizer of the of the panel, and uh, we 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 uh, met several times before this talk in order to get a common theme crossed. Um, uh, we our division labor, uh, as uh, the moderator said, uh, uh, Brazil. 
India and China. But actually, I, I decided to also cover some parts of India because uh, China-India comparison is, is really uh, something that I feel passionate about. Um, and I, I, um, uh, we actually share the same sense that the, the uh, GDP-driven or the number-driven uh, development policies uh, in, in all these countries perhaps uh, are inadequate. And China offers this, this most uh, typical case of number-driven development. Um, but I want to, uh, uh, but I, I, the, in the talk that I, I will uh, give soon, uh, that's actually not the, the real driver of China's economic growth. So if, if, if China had followed that kind of uh, number-driven uh, GDP growth, China wouldn't have achieved some of the, the economic miracle that the people uh, are, are praising now. I also want to share um, uh, some of the experience that I just had in Singapore. Uh, I spent the summer in Singapore. And then there, the, the Chinese organization department, uh, a, a vice minister level, led a delegation to Singapore. And he actually um, had a conference with, with us, you know, these so-called specialists and diaspora Chinese uh, scholars in Singapore. And he earnestly asked us, you know, how, 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 how could we do better? And uh, um, how, how, how can we uh, explain China's growth? Uh, because they also feel that the Western stories don't really capture their, their, their growth story and the, the Chinese, their own, uh, uh, their, their own explanations are also inadequate. So they were, they, they're, they're really talking to us, you know, number one, how can we tell our growth story? How can we explain China's growth so far? Number two, what can we do better? Uh, and so that actually relates to that Singapore has spent <laughs> lots of efforts in India. Because before I was, uh, just at the same time when I was there, the, the Singapore Prime Minister, they led a delegation uh, to visit India. And they said, they asked, uh, they actually told that uh, um, their counterparts in India, let us help you. And uh, <laughs> uh, we want to help build the infrastructure. We want to contribute to certain funds, technology experiences in, in, in building industry uh, infrastructure that are so critical to your, uh, to your economy. And the response that, that from the, uh, sing, uh, the, the Indian uh, counterparts were, your money are black money from us. You know? <laughs> so uh, so the, the Singaporean uh, delegation had to explain again and again that our money are clean. You know? <laughs> we are not the money laundering sites for, for, uh, for uh, capital outfly uh, uh, from, from uh, uh, India. Uh, but the incident really shows uh, um, if we use openness, you know, as an uh, um, uh, 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 indicator of the country's economic policy making or economic orientation, then in India is still way behind the Chinese. Um, uh, but but uh, so let me uh, go to the talk that I want to give. It's more detailed because I think these two general uh, theme are, are great setting up debates. But I also want to offer a little bit detailed uh, information on the on their uh, uh, foreign direct investments as well as the roles of diasporas because that really also indicates what kind of openness have been used in these two countries. Um, so that's a superficial comparison. Um, that's a China-India FDI compared. And they use uh, FDI flows, stock, or versus GDP, or per capita, or by the numbers of FDI, the assets, sales, profits, or FDI-led <laughs> exports, like uh, imports, share of national exports. So all these indicators uh, show that China's uh, Using uh, utilization FDI is way ahead of India, and that's that that that's a, a recognized fact. Um, but I also want to go in beyond this simple conclusion by offering you the diaspora's contribution to these numbers. 
um, maybe I'll just uh, because we are on the on the uh, statistical. So in China, that this fact actually hasn't been noted enough, and I, I think the growth story of China needs to needs to incorporate the uh, the, the diaspora investments uh, uh, strongly. So from from the uh, the beginning of the reform to the contemporary era, uh, China's diaspora investments constitutes majority, an absolutely majority. And that actually is not as important as what the kind of uh, di diaspora investments there, uh, focusing in <laughs> manufacturing, uh, exports. Uh, that, that's, we, we kept talking about job creation, right? job creation development. The diaspora investments in, in companies in China are precisely on the job creation. And uh, the, before 1985, the, the, this chart doesn't include that, um, but I went through uh, uh, the details of foreign uh, investments from the diaspora regions. And most of FDI went to infrastructure. So the infrastructure, now we know so well, you know, China has good infrastructure. But before 1990, uh, or even before 1995, most infrastructure money uh, came from this uh, diaspora invested fund. Um, so so the infrastructure was actually uh, uh, a consequence, uh, uh, not so much as a cause of these, uh, those investments. Um, but uh, I also uh, want to highlight that the, the, the Chinese uh, government, so if, um, I think one, call, one, one condition of them being very successful in attracting these diaspora investments, uh, not only because the Chinese diasporas were very rich and, and also had a tremendous experiences in commerce, global trade, uh, industry, uh, but also the Chinese government uh, throughout the 1980s were incredibly open. Um, uh, so the, this, this show the three levels of diaspora networks and uh, influence uh, in the, during the China's economic reform. So for instance, at the national level, the top leaders, I, I mentioned here Deng Xiaoping, I, I think this it would not be a very unfamiliar name to, to lots of people. But Deng Xiaoping, uh, people know that he is this strong man. But one thing was left out is he was incredibly open to diaspora uh, networks. He, he was friends with these uh, uh, leading members of Hong Kong, Macau, uh, Singapore, this uh, um, uh, business, uh, the kind of business like empire or you can call them tycoons. But the, the, another often left out uh, narrative is uh, the one of the three main uh, national organs you know, or uh, the Chinese People's Political Consultatory Conference. It, it sounds very, very odd. And that, that conference, it was at the level as a National People's Congress, National Party Congress. So it's really the, the highest level. Uh, it was uh, started uh, during the Maoist era, but was utilized so uh, uh, the dynamically by Deng Xiaoping, because this, this uh, organization was open to all kinds of you know, nationals, uh, not necessarily within the party. So Deng Xiaoping was the chair of this uh, conference, and he invited these um, uh, business representatives from, uh, uh, from the, the so-called overseas Chinese regions to serve uh, in, this, uh, uh, in the conference. And they repeatedly interacted, and they also offered policy ideas. So the, 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 the kind of involvement of these entrepreneurial uh, diasporas in the 1980s were very vibrant. And then at the local level, so they, uh, the Chinese, overseas Chinese, they uh, had a, a, a strong sentiments or devotion to their hometown. That's like a very common among diasporas. And diaspora, they, had, they actually have more uh, devotions to home, hometown than the, than the country. So it was the same with the Chinese. So these uh, local officials, again, were, uh, were interacting and were receiving their ideas found. Um, but the, uh, the, the societal level, that was precisely what was missing in, in many of the stories in Brazil or India. At the societal level, these small scaled investors, the entrepreneurs from the diaspora regions, they could have brought like a couple machines and went to a small 
village and talk to the local uh, uh, the officials and I want to set up factories and I can hire so many people uh, and uh, and then they have purchased they have export orders so things like it got spiraled out of these small scaled manufacturings in these uh, uh, villages small cities and the, the small city actually a fishing village ultimately became uh, Shenzhen right uh, no, nowadays the the, uh, the the very metropolitan bigger city in China but it was a fishing village it was it was small scaled uh, entrepreneurs uh, brought machines open shops hire people and then, then more shops opened by, by local entrepreneurs um, so, so 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 that kind of story was really missing and uh, uh, at a high level of policy, so this the, then feed back to the policy making, the Chinese policy regarding FDI. So the export zone, the first export zone in, in, in China was directly influenced by the, was initiated by a diaspora representative I, call, uh, I named here Yuan Geng, but this person was a local official. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the other person was, again, the central minister of communication. Uh, and the last person was the president uh, of, of China at the time. So you see the networks, how they work, and the, the, the story shows a strong contribution from the diaspora, but it also shows that at the time, the Chinese le uh, governments from top down, they, they were quite open. They were incredibly open to, to their influence. Uh, and for instance, when the, when the first SEZ bill, it's called Special Economic Zone Bill, was uh, deliberated, and the, the Chinese drafter, they just had lots of conferences with the diaspora representatives. And, and they, in, in, initially, they proposed a 33% tax rate. Um, but then the, the businessman from the diaspora region said, no, no, 33% no, uh, tax rate was too high. Um, the Chinese response was, well, then we'll reduce it in a way. We adopt the rate that you proposed. So the rate was 15%. Um, so the, um, uh, the, on the China story, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, maybe uh, show one, one thing just to add the importance of diaspora uh, contribution. And this city, is, um, th this chart is about Shanghai. So Shanghai in, in Western um, observers' eyes, it's like a very international, right? International city. It has lots of multinational <laughs> companies. And in Chinese, uh, uh, their own branding, they also brand Shanghai as this international Western. But when Shanghai, uh, if you, you check all their major uh, foreign projects, you know, so, so called foreign projects, and the, all the first, uh, were actually mainly predominantly by the um, by the uh, by the, the the contribution from diaspora entrepreneurs. Um, so the the um, the future. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, spend a little bit of time on India. So it, uh, on India, it's not that diaspora haven't played important role. We India just has and uh, is accomplish the diasporas as any countries can be. Um, but the, the, the return, the reception to, to the uh, return diaspora was much better to the professional uh, diasporas which had education in the West and uh, worked at, at the World Bank or IMF. So these, these uh, economists, they returned, they played direct policy making role. Actually, like uh, uh, my uh, advisor at, at Princeton, he, he called these uh, uh, elite technocrats. Uh, elite technocrats now controls policy making. So, uh, uh, the um, election actually don't affect their, their policy making capacity. So these are the, the people went back. But in terms of investment, um, India since 1991 when it just opened, the uh, diasporas also invested strongly. Uh, and you can see in the first five years or so, they invest about uh, less than a third, about 25 to 20, uh, 29 percent, quite a substantial. 
then two they, they declined. Not only in uh, in total amount uh, in sh in the share, but also in total amount. And then the uh, the the fund transferred more through remittances, and uh, you mentioned remittances, but actually deposit. So Indian diaspora deposited so much fund in China. Deposit is more than all the external funds combined, including FDI portfolio uh, investments in India. Uh, so the, 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 uh, again, that was used to finance some of the, the, the growth that, uh, that, that mentioned here. Um, I think that's really driven by uh, the policy. Um, because uh, starting the mid 1990s, India just uh, seemed to the p top policy makers seemed to forgot the diasporas. But in the early period, they actually set out uh, set up separate incentives, uh, more favorable conditions to to these small diaspora investors. And then afterwards, their uh, their development has has shifted. And I'll, I'll use uh, uh, the the one quote by. Uh, your, uh, uh, the Prime Minister Wajipayi in 2003, which I forgot to write down because it's, it's, it really signals India's um, policies. Um, so the Prime Minister uh, said to these diaspora conferences, the first diaspora conferences, and said, we do not want your uh, riches. We, wa we, we want the richness of your experience. We do not want your investments. We want your ideas. Uh, um, of course, the, 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 the shift was driven by much larger uh, issues that I will um, uh, uh, conclude uh, in the end. So it's, uh, you know, the state policy. So diaspora, they, their own resources play tremendous importance in how they influence their homeland. But state policy was really uh, crucial here. Um, so in terms of domestic politics, you know, do they open? You know, do, was the state open to this external uh, influence better, this diaspora influence, and uh, uh, domestic resistance? Like in China, here, maybe the regime would be important, but more importantly, uh, the, the, the domestic interests like, uh, uh, that potentially would prevent this influence didn't exist, like domestic capital actually was was absent uh, in China for most of the part. Um, and what they can, oh, I did write down the Wajipai's uh, quote here. Um, what can they learn from each other? Actually, when I was uh, uh, speaking to the Chinese delegation, and they were, they were saying, we should do the same, we should do this, rather than, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we do, uh, because China needed tremendous like, inputs in terms of um, experiences, ideas, but, but here, um, I, I think both countries, because we, we, we all talk about future, so maybe I'll end with a, cu a, a couple uh, remarks on the future. So far, the Chinese was quite open uh, up until 2000, perhaps. Um, but, but the next stage, the Chinese reform, required different types of uh, external inputs. But those inputs, Chinese polity was unable to uh, accommodate. Actually, they don't need to learn from the World Bank. They could just learn from Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, the, or, or some of the Southeast Asian uh, uh, regions. Um, for instance, their um, corruption rate, right? their social problems, um, uh, rule law, you know, all these uh, or political participation, all these um, development issues are so critical to the next phase of China's growth. But he, uh, or even Taiwan, you know, they had very had lots of experiences. But the Chinese were the Chinese politics thus far uh, could not accommodate uh, learning or idea transfers in these aspects be because of the, the CCP dominance, the Chinese Communist Party dominance. And in India, I think India uh, could uh, learn from China um, by opening more to these job creating uh, small industries. Uh, actually, I have a chart which I didn't show. That is, uh, the diaspora invested companies in India actually exported a lot more than the than domestic companies and foreign invested companies tremendously more uh, so they should uh, uh, offer more in, uh, incentives to uh, investments uh, in these areas so um, Indian debates I think they, they, they kind of uh, take uh, take to the next stage that they had to make choices between growth 
and the distribution, but you don't have to be. You know, there are different kinds of uh, growth model that, that, that may be better uh, in increasing uh, inclusiveness and uh, uh, hiring more people, improving in, uh, infrastructure, uh, things like that. So, so maybe not so fast, you know, just uh, going, going uh, get rid of the GDP, but think about how you can maintain certain growth uh, uh, target but while creating these social re, re, um, benefits that we, we want to see. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you. Again, that was a very insightful and interesting account of China's experience. And I think that our panelists have really set the stage well. So we'll now open up the discussion and take your views, questions, and comments. Since this is being taped, I would request that you wait till you have the mic before speaking. And I'd also request you to please tell us your name and affiliation when sharing your views. So. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Praveen. I'm from the School of Public Health uh, at the BU um, med, med School campus. Um, my question is uh, towards the India growth story. Uh, it's just a broader question beyond GDP. Why is the focus um, of publicity of the government is towards enhancing GDP, where growth can be viewed as um, health and well-being of a person? Uh, which means better public health infrastructure and not just money or materialistic uh, uh, approach. Right. So what you're saying is that when talking about, I mean, growth. when trying to assess the progress that India has made, you need to look beyond GDP, also look at indicators related to health and well-being. Yes, that's a very valid point because Generally, when talking about how India has been a success story, the focus has been on India's rapid economic growth. And growth is viewed as good because rapid growth makes the country look good in the eyes of international investors. But like I said, you also need to focus on you know, what this growth means in real terms. As I mentioned, there have been reports which clearly show that inequalities in consumption and income have increased. Public health indicators also aren't good. In fact, a lot of states which have shown rapid economic growth have also shown you know, not particularly significant declines in infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates, two vital health indicators. And I definitely think that if you look at India's overall health spending or by the government, that's extremely low even compared to a lot of other developing countries. So yes, I do think that definitely public expenditure, both towards social services, health care, and uh, you know, employment generation need to be increased over time. And definitely the government does need to look beyond pure growth these measures, which is what I tried to emphasize in this discussion. Hello, my name is Chris Kahns. I'm, I'm from the history department, uh, a doctoral student. I, I study Southern Africa. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. I uh, enjoyed them. Um, so in, in these discussions of these large-scale uh, economic growth paradigms, um, the emphasis seems to be, with few exceptions, uh, apart from the, the education initiatives and uh, job training mentioned with respect to India, um, the emphasis still seems to be on, on enabling uh, capital and investment to, to move wherever it is most needed. Um, wherever there are labor markets, uh, wherever there's mines to be quarried, uh, forests to be cut, uh, software to be developed, what, what have you. Uh, so I guess I, I, I'm wondering, I find it a little bit troubling that the, the, the sort of very material base, that is the environment uh, that, that uh, allows these initiatives to take place, uh, wasn't mentioned much. So I'm, I'm, my question is this, is uh, what, what is your research turning up um, in terms of uh, prospects for a long-term growth with respect to, to the environment. And I realize it's a broad question, 
Uh, but there's also a, a certain social dimension to it, uh, not only the materials that are uh, required for, for, for this sort of growth paradigm, um, but also the, the, the social implications for the people that live uh, on and around all of this, uh, this material base that, that is the environment. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I ask a clarifying question? Are you talking about the environment as environment or the social environment? Then? In, in all of the talks, I, one, of, one of the threads that I, I sort of picked up was enabling larger yeah. uh, amounts of capital to shift around to, uh, mm -hmm. not a lot of specifics were mentioned, but whether it's to build bridges or to open new factories or to attract labor markets to a certain area, all of these rest on uh, the the, the very sustenance that allows them to happen, whether it's fossil fuels or water or what have you. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering what, in terms of long-term growth, is, is any of your research turning up about these things? What are the sort of social and economic costs in the future with these, these things? Well, I think I think China really creates a paradox on these on this, uh, choices. Um, the, um, the the government uh, actually recognized uh, um, you know, the cost of environment and the growth of environment for quite a long time, and they also made lots of efforts like uh, using different kinds of energy um, and also uh, uh, improving the power of these environmental uh, uh, professionals. Um, uh, 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 the social consciousness of this. Um, I, I think there are a couple restraints in their efforts. The biggest one is that the, 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 the current government, they got so much legitimacy on growth. Uh, so either it's GDP or the, the, the materialistic uh, in, uh, indicators of rising household income uh, or the buildings. So they got tremendous legitimacy based on that. So having them to shift to a different kinds of development, that's very hard. It's like they had to shoot on their own. They had to, they had to be prepared that their own uh, power base might be uh, weakened. And the second part, again, related to the polity, uh, is uh, um, uh, the power of society is, is is weak. So if there are NGOs or, or social groups that advocate for environment, um, the, the, then they would be under constant uh, uh, restriction because it's, it's very worried that this could get out of hand to become more political events. But the third is, uh, the third actually offers more uh, possibility of change. That is nowadays environment related protests or mass incidents uh, uh, constitute the, the rising share of total uh, mass incidents in China. So currently, the peasants, we know about peasants' um, uh, incidents, you know, protests, or sometimes turning violent uh, protests in China. The number is rising rapidly. Actually, uh, if not half, then it's like the very approaching to the half of those incidents are related to, envi to environment. So that has... Um, put some uh, in a push on the government agenda because they really want to maintain social stability. But if they continue the growth model, which they draw legitimacy, but they, this cannot be continued because the, the cost of those act is creating its, uh, uh, its possible its uh, uh, demise. So, so we'll see more concerted efforts. Um, maybe I'll just uh, conclude. They are struggling between two, <laughs> two goals. It's uh, maintaining stability uh, and uh, while, while, while still continuing their, uh, uh, their legitimacy based on growth. So we, we, don't, we don't know, but the, 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 at least they show the government is, has stepped up efforts on addressing uh, the environmental issues. Can I say a few, a few yeah, things sure. in Brazil? So I, I, think, um, I think many, many Brazilians would, would argue that um, um, the government is very concerned with inclusive growth. And the basis of legitimacy there, which comes from an alliance between um, you know, states, social movements, uh, labor, is so heterogeneous that you can simply not have the Chinese um, strategy or even the, I would argue, the Indian one. Because the basis of legitimacy of the, of the political powers that be is very different. And that has translated into very different policies. Now, uh, 
it's a very broad discussion if we were to talk about uh, issue of redistribution. I argue that a real effort has been made there with significant uh, results below what it could have been achieved uh, because the, the social the socioeconomic dossier there remain, remains dire, uh, but much better than in the, in the 1990s. Uh, with regard to the environment, per se, as in nature, okay, uh, and living conditions in cities and so on, um, I mean, four other th issues that I'd like to mention. The, the first is that, you know, for the first time, the state has actually assumed the responsibility for uh, living conditions in, for the lower income brackets. So some of the biggest developments in sanitation and housing have taken place over the last, uh, the last uh, five uh, to six years, and to a scale that has never been uh, touched on before. The second is the, the pollution, and that's you know, one of the structural bottlenecks. If we are to expand it, it will be beyond, uh, beyond that. And, and he, this is very difficult because one of the pillars of uh, the government's industrial employment strategy is to support the car manufacturing sector, and that's like a humongous sector in Brazil. Uh, it's one of the engines of counter-cyclical spending, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, um, this has gotten much worse uh, since Lula, basically. Uh, congestion rates, pollution levels in large cities. Uh, the Rousseff government has had a paper last year that um, seems to be a game changer, and they're they are, you know, putting money into this for the first time. In the sense that they, they are spending, um, they earmarked very large uh, amounts of money for rail for the first time. They're building this high-speed train between Sao Paulo uh, and Rio. It costs a lot of money, and they're going to expand it uh, up north as well. So there's an international auction that has been uh, taking place. It costs a lot of money. The, the government, international investors, didn't want to put the money into digging the tunnels. It's a very mountainous area. The government has gone in and accepted the costs. Uh, the initial auction failed precisely because of this. International investors just wanted to build the rail, put the trains on the rail, and operate them. Didn't want to build the infrastructure itself. The government is, is, um, is um, paying for it. Um, so there is this. A little bit of a tension there because all of this equipment will be imported, right? And the whole point of neo-developmentalism is to uh, establish a strong domestic manufacturing base. And, you know, cleaner transport means it is done with foreign products, usually, and, and capital. So there's a bit of a tension on, uh, to be addressed there. Um, the third aspect is the rainforest. It's a disaster there. Um, and it's a very complicated story and, and not necessarily the most comforting one in the sense that some of the members of the coalition that made Lula possible, right? Uh, many of the landless are part of the deforestation process because, you know, they need land and, and so on. And so it's very hard for the government to simply repress them. They have very large investment in road building for the rainforest that they want to ca carry through. Um, so there's a lot of contentious politics surrounding that. And finally, the, the, the issue of energy, right? Um, Brazil's, uh, you know, biggest uh, economic actor is, uh, is a state-owned oil company, right? And they have crazy plans of digging in the pre-salt layers. And that's one of the sources of wealth in Brazil. They are diverting the money into a sovereign wealth fund, so everything sounds great. Uh, <clears throat> they had this very experimental biofuel program that has, gone ex that has been the most successful in the world, basically. Uh, but now we're seeing the side uh, negative effects of that uh, occurring uh, in terms of the quality of, of the environment as well. So these are the things. I mean, they, they, they do have the plans. It's, you know, the problem of enforcement is relatively weak. Uh, regional governments have very weak institutional capacity. Uh, so observing environmental regulations, not so great. Um, a lot of international consulting has gone into this, so the regulations are, are progressive. But... There are these tensions between the new developmentalist project aimed at better quality of life as in income and employment for as many people as possible and the environmental agenda. And, you know, I'm not in the business of prediction uh, to, to tell you what is going to happen, but the social coalitions that surround these debates will probably de decide what's going to happen. Thanks. That's a very interesting question because even in India, some people who've been, you know, critical of the growth process have emphasized that this rapid economic growth hasn't, you know, been thought of adequately as far as the long-term environmental implications go. I mean, particularly in the last seven or eight years, you had several projects involving the use of, you know, forest land, mining, etc., which were just cleared without a proper inspection first. In fact, um, our recent environment minister who had a more competent record and who was more scrupulous than a lot of our previous ministers had, 
jocularly remarked that the people who carry out these initial inspections are the people who are ultimately going to you know, be using these resources. So it would be in their interest to give an all clear report. And particularly in the context of developing countries like Brazil, India, China, environmental protection isn't really a luxury because you know, a lot of people depend for their livelihoods and sustenance on these resources. So when talking about growth policies and you know what looks good and so forth, you also need to take into account these broader environmental implications, both from the point of view of long-term sustainability and from the point of view of the effect that you know such projects can have on local livelihoods. And particularly given the recent corruption scandals that have come to light regarding the allotment of these environmental resources. You have had uh, the Forest Regulation Act being recently passed in Indian Parliament, which seeks to regulate the allocation of these resources more closely. So I do hope that efforts like these would, you know, help to institute more checks and balances to ensure that the growth process also takes into account the longer term environmental implications over time. My name. Yeah, my name is Yu Lei. I come from Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, and uh, I'm now uh, a visiting fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, I think this uh, today's topic is very interesting and important. And uh, firstly, thanks uh, for your three scholars' very excellent presentation. <coughs> and uh, uh, my area is also about the foreign direct investment uh, in China and uh, some comparison about uh, India. And uh, uh, as we uh, all know, China has uh, gained a very fast growth in recent years after the 1970s. And uh, there is two main factors of the growth. One is FDI and one is export. export. Uh, uh, China now is the first uh, top one of the exportation country and the top one to attractive FDI in the uh, developing countries, uh, but these uh, two data uh, has some link because uh, I give you some figures. Uh, because in China, the uh, the about fifty percent of the expo exportation is belong to the multinational company, and uh, uh, if we look at the high tech sector, this may be about uh, uh, about eighty or ninety percent of the exportation. So. The exportation in China uh, most belong to the multinational companies in China. So this is a different uh, 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 different thing. It's not only by the Chinese own capacity, and uh, but for the India, this is different in the past because uh, India uh, they are. Initial stage of the uh, tra of the of the platform is different uh, to the China. Uh, they want to develop their own capacity of the uh, factory, the industry. They in some areas they don't very welcome a uh, foreign investor. Uh, just like China, so they have developed very famous companies in India, very big famous companies. Uh, the, these companies include the all world, uh, uh, all world. But uh, just uh, as uh, mm, Jana's uh, top topic presentation, you mentioned that in recent years India has depend more and more to the export. And uh, in recent years, the FDI in India is arising than before. So uh, this is some like the past that China has just uh, uh, through in the past. And uh, in China, we think about uh, our model de de very depend depend mostly on the exportation, mostly on the FDI has some disadvantage. Uh, so. Uh, how do you think about the India's new path? Um, do you, uh, could you give some comment of it? Thank you. Um, so what do I think of India's new uh, uh, approach as far as FDI goes? Uh, 
Oh, well, I think, I mean, the government has recently announced its decision to open up the retail sector to FTI. That's the latest policy that the government has undertaken as far as FTI and India goes. And the arguments that it has made is that it would help to strengthen supply chains, result in lower prices, and generate more jobs. But, you know, I'm not too sure about these arguments because, you know, there's been evidence from the developed world, from Europe and from the U.S., which clearly show that, in fact, when you have, you know, large-scale supermarkets coming to dominate the retail sector, it, in fact, widens the margins by, you know, leading to really steep decreases in prices which only the supermarkets can sustain and which works to the disadvantage of other local producers. I mean, this, these have been con concerns which have been voiced in India, and there's evidence already in Europe which suggests that, you know, supermarkets have benefited at the expense of smaller producers. So as far as the argument that it will result in lower prices goes, I'm not too sure about that. Secondly, if you look at India's employment structure, there are a large number of small-scale retailers whose very livelihood depends, you know, on local stores, on, you know, their, their local businesses and so on. So, I, and I don't think that the government has adequately paid attention to, you know, the effect that this kind of large-scale investment will have on their livelihoods. I mean, there's been one study which has estimated that a Walmart would approximately result in job losses of close to 40,000, which is significant. So, I mean, I really think that the focus needs to be more on ways in which uh, domestic purchasing power can be increased over time through the generation of quality employment, as I mentioned with a focus on expanding formal domestic markets rather than you know this obsession with attracting foreign capital inflows from abroad by way of <coughs> FDI and portfolio. I mean even if you look at the argument that FDI helps to improve the export competitiveness of domestic industries most of the FDI companies in India have focused on the domestic market so They've not really helped to improve the export competitiveness over time. T technological spillovers also haven't been there because most of their technological equipment comes from parent companies abroad. So, I mean, I really think that there needs to be a shift in policy that focuses more on the domestic market rather than focuses on ways to, you know, integrate the Indian economy further into the world market. Can I comment on the Indian case? Sure. Uh, I, um, I, I'm very familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, Indian arguments against uh, retail opening. Uh, but I think uh, uh, take the Chinese experience, that even you open the retail, Walmart would not come to dominate Delhi. I think if they can open one shop in the suburb of Delhi, that will be it. So it would not wipe out the retails, yeah, these uh, small shops in the city, because um, uh, uh, it, it, it's very expensive to open, uh, it's very complex to, to open uh, a big retail, sh retail uh, uh, shops. Um, and uh, another, uh, my experience uh, living in Delhi is lots of the small shops are really they they are, they are they really need uh, upgrading uh, in terms of price. They they, they have to, they just don't have uh, competitiveness in in price. Um, so I, I'm 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 suggesting is that even your open retail sector, number one, Western retailers would not come. Number two, they would not dominate and wipe out all the retail, small retailers. Uh, number three, uh, you you cannot uh, protect the market and expecting that they would evolve into a free market because you were you were, you were protected. And uh, if lacking competition, then the the um, the, the pros prospects of uh, even improving domestic domestic market would be uh, much um, much more limited. Um, because think about China open retail sector in the 1980s, about only like 
decades after this opening, the Western retailers came, and that was already way after this. This uh, uh, diasporas who open shops in Shanghai, they um, they 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 uh, not in direct competition, but by providing different products. You know, by the, because there are different uh, the consum consumption markets in the cities which were unmet if you close a market, and when you open, then the small shops will come rather than the bigger ones. Um, so uh, I, I'm very familiar with with uh, protectionist uh, arguments, but I think that's 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 that's, that's overly um, uh, you know fearful. It, it it shouldn't be. I mean, if you are uh, Indian, the uh, are very entrepreneurial. Indians that I know are incredibly entrepreneurial, uh, incredibly strategic, and. and they will not be out competed by some foreigners, and uh, um, with not knowing the customs and the for the Western managers actually they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to go. You know, uh, as 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 the, the my basic point is fear sometimes is more exaggerated when you don't have the 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 existence of, of foreign com for, for, for foreign competitors. Once you see them, you know you could defeat them. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you have valid reasons for, you know, these conclusions. I mean, it's true, but I also feel that sometimes, I mean, you shouldn't fear foreign investors, but sometimes I think people or uh, government also tends to underestimate the risks associated with unrestricted foreign capital inflows into the country and I mean I'm going by what studies and reports have suggested and I mean they they do suggest that there would be uh, it would have adverse effects on the yeah, local population I which I think need yeah. to be kept into yeah. account I mean definitely you need to have more clauses within FDI policies which you know encourage joint ventures which I mean has been a defining feature of China's FDI policies I mean that's how China emerged as a competitor to be reckoned with in the electronics industry I mean in India uh, recently this year IKEA one of the major global players in the retail sector you know, oppose, ha, voiced opposition to, you know, government requirement in India that uh, I forget about 30% of their uh, inputs be sourced from local manufacturers. And, you know, the government has now been talking of deleting that clause because of this opposition. So I do feel that, yes, there are potential benefits of the kind which you suggest, but I also think that for, to realize those potential benefits, you also need to have these kinds of clauses in policies concerning FDI and foreign capital participation in developing countries, which China has done quite successfully, but I can't say the same about India. Okay, we have time for one more question. Oh, okay, two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I'm, I'm Tian Yuan from the Department of Economics at Western University, and I'm currently a PhD student major in development economics. So first, uh, thank you for uh, three of your um, uh, lectures about the economic development economics and my question is mm, first I I'm a little bit concerned with Chinese Chinese development economics and uh, on the on your slides you said that we need more openness of the state and uh, what I want to ask is for the credit market you know that in China the the credit market is not so uh, adequate and the uh, way we need to get some improvement. So, what's your suggestions? And uh, for India, I I I remember you told us that the tremendous growth in uh, Indian GDP from 2003 to 2007. Uh, one of the major draw um, major uh, elements is the uh, financial markets that drives this increment and I want to ask that for this incre increment um, so what do you think that um, Indian can can do to gain more improvement in that part 
in the financial? Yeah, in the credit market. Uh, for example, I, I, I read one of the papers, uh, uh, gave some exa uh, do some research uh, during the 1990s that India had uh, started their microfinance in rural areas. And uh, now, nowadays, uh, there has some, some crisis happened there. And what should they, they do and do? Um, yeah, that's my question. Yeah. Thank you. No, thanks. That's an interesting question. And I'll also take your question and then we'll yeah, that sounds answer. Good. Yeah, we should do that. Uh, yeah, my question, um, I'm Max. I'm an undergrad at BU. Um, my question was kind of related to that. Um, I've noticed that you guys didn't really talk about microfinance too much. And I was just curious as mm -hmm. to how um, microfinancial, like Grameen style principles, are being advocated in those countries to kind of. Um, I guess correct for some social shortcomings that um, result from growth. Yeah. So. Yeah. On on China, um, that's a very good question. So what I argue that China has been more open in terms of the manufacturing FDI, but China was not open at all in banking sector in credit market. So that really shows, for instance, banking reform in China was only started after 2003. And there was very lengthy bit debate of opening the banking sector. And it was like a pressured by what, what WTO negotiation over and over. And the fear was very similar as what you would hear in India, that once the Western ban uh, banks who had uh, more capital, uh, better uh, technology, better personnel, if they came, the, banking se the Chinese banks would be overwhelmed. But you know what? After seven years, only uh, Bank of America had a minority share with construction bank, and his, it, the Bank of America is selling its share. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, because it's very hard to operate in the Chinese environment for Western uh, uh, companies. In terms of uh, a second point is another misperception that China's uh, uh, liberalization opening is progressive. Actually, it's not progressive. It's, it's uh, counter-progressive. So let's see the microfinancing. There's a rural credit market. We're much more open before 2000 and then today. So be, before um, the mid-1990s, there was a, a credit reform. Those small rural credits, they were actually operating actively, uh, loaning to uh, uh, peasants or small factories, uh, plants. Uh, but after then, the, the central government uh, eliminated most of these rural credits. So microfinancing, if China didn't use the term, but there's a cre credit unions were actually very active uh, in China. But their, their, uh, their, their uh, presence, their operation was actually uh, uh, reduced sharply by the government in order to, to have a, 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 a centralized banking system. So in these areas, it will be the branches of these four major banks rather than these credit unions who specifically serve the community. So some of them still exist, uh, still exist, but the number is in decline and the resources is de in decline. They are really not doing their work anymore. Um, so, so I guess that, that's addressed to both your questions. Yeah. Cornell, do you want to say something? Just very quickly, uh, I think the Brazilians are very cynical about microfinance having any like significant effect on you know the, the issues that the, the country is struggling with. Um, hence, um, the stress they have put on having a very large development bank that is state-owned and, and that can direct investment at areas that maximize employment because they think that it's easier to create jobs, quality jobs like that. Uh, they are very uh, cynical about the record of, um, of microfinance in actually making a difference for the poor. Um, they know Africa very well, uh, especially uh, you know, Brazilian investments in, in uh, Angola, for example, uh, where there's a lot of microfinance experimentation taking place, have been very illuminating, I think, for policymakers. So if you talk to them, they say, look, you know, at the end of the day, what really makes a difference is that we have enough money to give to like large companies that some of which are state owned, some of which um, the state has minority shares. And <coughs> it provides nice unionized jobs with decent wages. I think that's a, like a real deal as opposed to like, let's turn you know, the poor into like great entrepreneurs overnight that, that won't happen. They're very, very, this is the kind of discourse I'm not saying. Uh, the other thing is, um, unlike many other banking sectors, the Brazilian banking sector is one of the most prudently regulated in the world, uh, in the Americas. Uh, 
uh, they haven't really had any major banking crashes. So the, the, the one thing that really constrained lending to small businesses has been the fact that they had these what they call state banks, because Brazil is a federal state, so they had these state-owned like state banks inside Brazil, and um, they sold them mostly to, to multinational banks, uh, mostly Spanish banks, to be honest. I mean, one of the reasons why the Spanish banking sector is doing so great is that they invested a lot in Brazil. Uh, unlike their country, you know, they're not underwater. Uh, the large banks, the top, the top three banks there. Um, and the third uh, element I would like to mention is that, um, you know, in order to have microfinance to make a difference, you need a very supportive state, right? Uh, and that is not happening there. It won't happen anytime soon. You can do whatever you want as a microfinance enterprise. There's lots of them going there. Lots of gra gram and ba bank style um, uh, favela uh, investments have taken place. But, you know, like, really the record has not been overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, I agree with uh, Cornell. I mean, I, I also do have reservations about microfinance. I think that one of the adverse effects that the Indian manufacturing sector is still trying to cope with is the disappearance of development financial institutions since the 1990s, which you know have created further bottlenecks when it comes to allowing Indian manufacturers to gain access to credit to upgrade machinery and equipment, replace obsolete machinery. So I definitely think that Another area of focus for the Indian policymakers when it comes to thinking of ways to accelerate the growth and expansion of the manufacturing sector, and making it more competitive over time, is to establish more development financial institutions which will cater mm -hmm. not just to industrial entrepreneurs, but they also these institutions also served as a source of finance for more small scale and medium enterprises, which are a major part of India's manufacturing sector. You've also had the banking sector reducing its um, credit uh, to the manufacturing sector in the 1990s, which has again created bottlenecks and in allowing Indian manufacturers, you know, access to the finance that they need to upgrade and, you know, uh, invest in more productive equipment. So I think that the established bringing development financial institutions back into being a dominant aspect mm. of India's industrial. Yeah, provided like there is there some is, mandate you know. that can be regulated, because you know, in this case, you know, the, Brazil is the country in the world after China that really has like a very powerful state bank that yeah, does investments, were, but they don't give anything to small enterprises. Right. No, they, these, they just don't yeah. care about them. So these were uh, these institutions were regulated right. by the government, and I mean, they did you know contribute in a big way to yeah. you know financing small scale medium enterprises not anymore not in, in brazil now they yeah. don't they're not doing it uh -huh. very yeah. little yeah and no that's something that you way. definitely they just funded the merger of two supermarket chains i mean that oh. was like one of the biggest and they had to back off because there was so much outcry over it. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay so Thank, thank you, you both for joining us and thank you for thank a very interesting discussion.